So we give it one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's 10.04 and hopefully. Well, hopefully we'll get <clears throat> maybe one or two more people that will join us as we uh, go along here, but I do want to be respectful of everybody, of everybody, but I can't talk of everybody's time today. So, um, you know, well, I'm sure we're all busy. So um, very quickly, I want to make uh, just a real quick introduction of myself, and then uh, later in the agenda, we'll we'll go around and introduce everybody else. But uh, my name is Brent Riddle. I'm um, the Title VI Policy Officer for uh, the Department of Transportation. Uh, I work in the Coordination and Funding Division at FCDOT, um, and <clears throat> we are here today because we've invited you here today because we are at the uh, we have a Title VI plan that has to be updated every three years. Um, and as part of that plan, we um, we look at and we evaluate the county's major service change and disparate impact and disproportionate burden policies. Um, and as part of that evaluation, we you know go out to the public, go out to individuals like yourselves to get your uh, feedback on the proposed policies. Um, and so today, what well, what you will see is um, we'll have a presentation that really gets into details about the major service change policy that's being proposed and also the disparate impact and disproportionate burden policy that's being proposed. Uh, here's the agenda for the day. Um, and during that presentation, we'll invite your feedback you know, all along and then we'll have just sort of a general discussion at the end to, to wrap everything up. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, get to can you go to the next slide, Russell? Thanks. So I think we'll start with introductions now uh, with the rest of the team. Um, like I said, I'm Brent Riddle with Fairfax County. We do have some other staff from Fairfax County that are here. And then after Fairfax staff is gone, uh, I'll invite the Foursquare ITP staff, the consultant team to to make introductions as well. So Robin, do you want to go? Sure. Hey, I'm Robin Geiger, and I'm Chief of Marketing and Communications for the Fairfax County Department of Transportation. Glad to have you. Kyle? Hi, I'm, hi, I'm Kyle Davis. I'm a transportation planner with FCDOT, and I welcome everyone to the stakeholder meeting. Hey, June. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Heijun Kang, working for FCDOT, the Transit Service Planning Section. And Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Daly. I'm with the Marketing and Communications team. Welcome. And now I'll turn the floor over to our consultant team. Lori, do you want to kick off your side? Sure. Um, Catherine just sent a message um, that they can't hear us at all. Um, Let's. Oh, huh, OK. Uh, let's maybe talk in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Um, but we can continue with with intros and try to get Catherine's audio working because I can hear everyone. So I think I think the audio is OK and it might be just an issue on Catherine's side. Um, my name is Lori Zeller. I am with Foursquare ITP. Uh, my pronouns are they them and I'm a project manager and senior transportation planner. I am the project manager for the Title VI program update. Um, Rachel, would you like to go next? Yes, hello, my name is Rachel Staley, pronouns she, her. 
I'm a junior transportation planner at Foursquare ITP, and I've been doing a lot of the planning work and data collection for this project. Good morning, everybody. My name is Russell Pildes. I'm a senior transportation planner at Foursquare ITP. I've been working with Rachel and Lori on various aspects of this plan, including the language access plan and, and these major service change policy uh, updates. I'm excited to talk to you all today. Great, and now we can move on to our other introductions for our attendees. Um, hopefully we can get Catherine's audio working. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, we would love to hear um, you introduce yourselves, turn your camera on if you feel comfortable with that, um, and share your name, your organization, and your role at your organization. And also we'd like to know how the people that you represent use Fairfax Connector services, are there certain routes or destinations that are particularly important to them? We just want to get to know a little bit more about um, what what you do, how, the people that you work with, um, and how Fairfax Connector plays a role in their lives. Um, Ivana, would you like to go first? Sure, I can go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ivana Escobar, and I work for a United Community. I am the director of Collective Impact. I oversee our Opportunity Neighborhood Mount Vernon initiative. Um, for the second question, how do the people? Oh, they are with those are the people that we work with. Uh, we work with um, families and individuals that live in the Route 1 corridor, and they use the Fairfax connector to go to the grocery, to go to work. Um, other specific destinations. I would say uh, the destinations that are most important to them would be um, one thing I just hear is that they use it just through get to, from point A to point B within the, the Richmond Highway. Um, but the biggest, um, I guess, fallback is the timing of when it comes. So I've heard before that they said if you miss it, the next bus will come within 30 minutes. So that really prevents people, especially if you're dependent on the bus to go to work. If you do miss it, you already automatically know that you are going to have to call in and tell them that you're late. Um, but yes, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Catherine, would you be able to introduce yourself in the chat, please, with um, your name, organization, and role, how people you represent use Fairfax Connector? Um, and Wamik, would you be able to introduce yourself as well, please? Good morning, everyone. I am Wamik Marshall Washington. I am the Director of Community Services with Cornerstones. Um, and I believe most of our clientele, just like Ivana just highlighted, use Connector just to for everyday living, get to getting back forth to work for you know shopping, for visiting family, and certainly for attending services. And again, as Ivana highlighted, I think the the, the greatest challenge is um, the length of time that it takes to get to point from point A to point B, um, and uh, the challenges that that presents from time to time, uh, particularly for our seniors or those with medical issues. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Catherine. Um, for your introduction in the chat. And we can um, move on to our next slide. So the purpose of today's discussion is that we have some specific outreach that we need to do that Brent had introduced for this Title VI program update. Um, so we're going to talk about the Title VI equity analyses and how they work and then the policies that are related to those analyses because we're looking for community feedback on the proposed updates to these policies. Um, and when you're responding to your, the questions that we're going to ask today and providing comment, please um, think about it from the perspective of the people that you serve or represent or yourself um, from your own perspective. Um, and we want today's discussion to be interactive, so we'll be asking for your thoughts and questions throughout the session. Um, some of the policies that we'll be going through are a little bit on the complex side, um, so please uh, interrupt us at any time um, to ask any type of question that you might have or any kind of clarification. Um, we are very, very open to that. Um, yeah.
Lori, as we move forward, will the recording and the slides be made available? Um, Brent, what what will we be doing with? We I think we can share slides. I'm not sure what's the plan with the recording. It's we can put the question. recording. We'll put the recording on the our uh, Title Six website, and we'll make that available to you. Thank you. Great. We also um, have a public survey that is now live. Um, the policies that we're looking for your feedback um, today, we're also looking for um, a wider range of feedback from anybody who's able to take the survey, whether they're members of the public, work for a community-based organization, um, we'd love for you to respond and for you to share the survey links with um, people you work with, other neighbors, friends, um, other folks who live in Fairfax County, just so we can try to reach as many people as possible and get their input. Um, I'll drop that link in the chat uh, in a moment, and we'll also um, we can also go back to this a little bit later. Okay, so before, yeah, before we dive into the policies, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Act in Title VI and give a little refresher on what it is. Oh, did Rachel freeze? I believe so. <laughs> yeah, she looks frozen. That is going in and out. Can you all hear me? Sorry, my internet got weird for a minute. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're we back. didn't hear. We can hear you now. We can hear you now, and we didn't hear okay. anything you said on this slide. <laughs> okay, great. So, getting back on. Title VI is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and essentially states that if a program or activity is receiving financial assistance from the federal government, then no person should be discriminated against or denied participation based on race, color, or national origin. So what exactly does this mean for transit? So if we go to the next slide, we know that Title VI is focused on discrimination with, within federally assisted programs, and FTA distributes federal funds to transit providers. So when transit providers receive any type of funding from FTA, they must comply with Title VI because that funding is coming from the federal government. And FTA has released the Title VI circular, which outlines the specific compliance actions that agencies must follow. And then FTA recipients can submit those circular requirements every three years in order to comply with Title VI. So what does this look like in practice? In order to meet those requirements outlined in the circular, transit providers that are receiving federal assistance are required to submit the Title VI program update to FTA every three years. So the previous FCDOT update was in 2020, so we're now here three years later to update it again. And the purpose of the document is to show that agencies are not discriminating based on race, ethnicity, or national origin, and to detail the specific steps that they're taking in order to prevent future discrimination. So I'll pause here for a minute. Uh, does this make sense? Do we have any questions about Title VI? We don't have questions. I uh, can move on and talk a little bit more about the Title VI document that's submitted and the different sections that are included. So the planning document that's submitted to FTA is called the Title VI program, and there are three major chapters included. The first is an introduction and description of service, which introduces Title VI and Fairfax Connector service, and also highlights any important updates since the last Title VI program. The second is a description of service and planning for Title VI, which includes various procedures, demographic and travel patterns, and also the public participation plan and language access plan, which describes the language needs throughout the county and highlights resources available to residents with limited English proficiency. And then lastly, chapter three is focused on the various service standards and policies that FCDOT has developed to ensure equitable service and amenities throughout the county. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And we'll specifically be talking about the major service change policy and the disparate impact and disproportionate burden policy. And together, those policies help to ensure that service changes are equitable. 
So we'll get into discussing these policies in just a minute, but first I'm going to walk through a few key definitions to keep in mind as we're going through the policies. Uh, the first two are revenue service hours and revenue service miles, and these will come up with the major service change policy. When we use these terms, we're referring to the number of hours or number of miles that a bus operates while carrying paying passengers. So it only refers to when the bus is actually in service. It would not include any time or mileage spent, for example, driving from the last stop to the bus garage at the end of the day. Next, we have route area and service area. Uh, these can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around, but they're an important part of the DI and DB policies. So the route area is the geographic area that would be impacted by a proposed service change, whereas the service area is the geographic area that's served by the entire transit system. So the service area encompasses several different route areas. And lastly, we wanted to clarify minority and low income populations since these percentages have to be calculated in order to determine if there's a DI or a DB. So when we say minority, we're referring to any person that is not non-Hispanic and white, and this accounts for about 50% of the service area. And low income population includes households making less than $60,000 a year, which accounts for about 19% of the service area. Uh, so before we move forward, does anyone have questions or need clarification about any of the definitions or anything that was discussed before that? And I don't know if everybody is familiar with Teams, but there is a raise hand feature on the top of your toolbar. So if you do have a question uh, and. You know, feel free to use that or speak up, but just letting you know what your options are. Or write in the chat at any time. We'll be monitoring the chat as well. I'm not sure if this is the best time to ask this question, but since we're here, um, it says that um, low income population is 19% of uh, Fairfax County, but what percentage of those that use the service would the low income population be? The last data, question. the last data available for that were from, and, and staff, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last data available for that were from a 2019 survey of riders, um, and I can look that up. I don't know it off the top of my head. Does anybody know that off the top yeah, of your head? This, this is a hey June, and uh, it, Laurie is correct. We have the 2019 onboard survey asking people their uh, household income, and it's around 67% of Fairfax Connector riders are low income. Thank you, hey June. And it looks like from that same survey, oh, I see 67% of riders are minority. Yeah, and 66% were low income. 66, 66 low income and 67% uh, people of color? Yes. Based on the 2019 ridership. And I believe, will there be another onboard survey in the next year or so? Yeah, we do have the, the new onboard survey planned for the fiscal year 24, so from July this year to June next year. So um, yeah, generally we found basically our riders are more like a minority or low income. They tend to ride buses more compared to other groups of population. OK, well, we can move on to our first um, policy discussion if there's no other questions at this time. So the first policy that we're going to go over is the major service change policy, and this is one of the things that we're looking for your feedback on um, as this is an important update within the. Uh, the Fairfax County DOT and Fairfax Connector uh, Title VI program update. So first we're going to talk about what a major service change actually is. Um, it is a change that is significant or major enough to warrant further analysis. And transit agencies must define what changes qualify as a major service change in a written policy in their Title VI program. Um, so it's basically something that tries to set 
a threshold of um, a service change if it is significant enough to require further analysis to see if there's any kind of equity impacts. Um, and if that further analysis were to occur, that would be triggered by a major service change, that would be known as a service or a fair equity analysis. So here, this is the two options that basically would happen um, when you're looking to see if a service change would meet the major service change policy definition. If the service change does not meet the major service change policy definition, then no further action would be required under the Title VI portion of, of the planning effort. Um, this service change could then proceed without the analysis of impacts to Title VI protected populations. But if the major service change is triggered, then the transit agency needs to conduct a service or a fair equity analysis to determine if the service change impacts are shared equitably across minority and non-minority and low income and non-low income groups. So when we're gonna be talking about this proposed policy, um, we're basically trying to set that threshold of, is a service change small enough that it doesn't require this extra equity analysis? Um, Cause service changes can be so small, they can be a minor schedule adjustment, or could it be something that is major enough that we really do need to look further into it to see if there could potentially be impacts on uh, minority or low income populations. So like I said, agencies can set their own major service change policies. It's a Title VI requirement that they set a policy, but it's up to the agency to determine their policy. Um, and these policies can often include mention of uh, subjects such as service availability, which could be the service span, basically how long the service runs on any given day, or the number of service days, the amount of service that's offered, such as the frequency of the service or the revenue miles or hours, like Rachel had introduced that concept a few moments ago. Um, the policies can also include mention of the geographic alignments, which would mean the areas or the neighborhoods served. And they can also include mention of the fares, which would typically involve any type of change to fares. And then within a major service change, we're also talking about the possibility that service can be reduced or removed or service could be expanded or added. So service could be um, maybe a route is being cut back by a couple hours in the evening or maybe a route's being eliminated. That would be a reduction or removal of service. And then in terms of expanding or adding service, maybe a route is currently operating every 30 minutes but the proposed change is for it to operate every 15 minutes, or um, a route could be added that wasn't there before. Those are the types of things that could be an expansion or an addition of service. Wamik, you have a question? You may have just touched on it, but um, when you're setting the threshold, is that in comparison to known ridership or is that in comparison to the population in the geographic area? For the major service change, we aren't at the point yet in the analysis process where we're talking about the population-based impacts. When we're talking about the major service change, it's a policy that's based on the amount of service being provided. And then when we move on to the next policies about disparate impact and disproportionate burden, those are policies that are going to be related to the population impacted by the changes. So it's kind of like a two-step process. First, we look at the amount of service being provided, is the service being significantly changed that we really do need to further analyze it to see if it does have an impact on populations. Um, so that's, it's kind of like a two-step process with a major service change. We either, it's the, the change is small enough perhaps that we don't need to do a further analysis and then the process is over. Or if the amount of service being provided is significant enough, then we know we need to move on and do the further population-based analysis. And this is Russell to add one more detail to that too. Wamik, you asked about ridership. The way that the policy is set and that subsequent analysis is done is not on the ridership itself, but on the people who live in the route area compared to the people who live in the service area. That was why when Rachel was talking about those two things, it was about the people who live within a distance of 
the route who could be served as opposed to the people who are today riding the bus, for example. Thank you, Russell, for that clarification. Okay, and then we can um, just continue back on the major service change policy. Sorry, Russell, I think there was one more bullet on that side I needed to get to. Um, right, okay, we said this already that we are uh, required to revise and conduct outreach on the policies with every Title VI program update, which is every three years. So that's what we're doing today. And there are, are some exemptions to major service changes. Um, anything that's a seasonal service change, like adding or removing a route or trips due to seasonal demand, wouldn't have to go through the process of being evaluated for a major service change. Any type of pilot or demonstration route, so like trying out a new route to see if maybe there's enough ridership, if people are interested enough in riding it, um, if that's being piloted for 12 months or less, that actual pilot program doesn't need to undergo the process of evaluating if it's a major service change or not. Um, if the route continued after 12 months, then of course that process would have to happen. And then also temporary service changes of less than 12 months. This could be changes due to weather or other emergencies or events. Um, any type of changes like that uh, wouldn't be subject to the major service change. Okay, so now we're at the actual recommended policy for major service change. And the recommended policy is a major service change is defined as either an increase or a decrease of 25% or more in either daily revenue service hours, revenue service miles, or both for the individual route being modified. And this is the policy um, that was present in the previous Title VI program, and FCDO FCDOT is not proposing uh, changing this policy. It seems to have been uh, working well. Um, and now we'll get into some more examples that kind of show how this 25% threshold for the major service change policy, what that really means in reality. So our first example, um, let's say there's a bus that operates a 12 mile route today, but the proposed change is that it's shortened to only operate for nine miles. That is a decrease of service of 25%. And since the proposed threshold is 25%, this would be considered a major service change. But contrastingly, in our next example, let's say that same 12 mile route was shortened to 10 miles. So on the previous slide, it was shortened to nine miles, and this slide is shortened to 10 miles. That's a change of a decrease in service of 17%. Because 17 is less than 25, it doesn't meet that threshold for being a major service change. And this proposed change would not be subject to the further analysis of um, looking at the population around the route area compared to the whole service area to see if there's any equity potential equity implications for um, minority or low income population living around the route. So that's one example. And then we also have an example about um, the time since this policy has to do with both revenue miles and revenue hours. Um, it's very similar concept. Let's say a bus today currently operates from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So it's operating for 12 hours today, but the proposed change is for it to operate to, to end service earlier in the evening, it'll end at 5 p.m. So three fewer hours of service. That would be a 25% reduction in hours of service. Um, and because it's 25, that would meet the major service change policy. So this type of change would then be subject to the further analysis. And then similar to our first example, um, let's say the bus route was recommended to end service instead of at 5 p.m. at 6 p.m., so one more hour of service. So it's going from 12 hours a day to 10 hours a day. That's only a reduction of 17%, so it doesn't meet that 25% threshold. And this would not, this service change then would not be subject to further analysis. So what we're really trying to learn um, from you all today and from the survey that we're releasing is what do you think of that threshold, that 25% threshold? We looked at a couple examples of how um, the major service change could either be triggered or not triggered. Um, 
And when it is triggered, then that service change would have to then undergo further analysis. Um, do you think that policy is appropriate? Should it be changed? Um, and what kinds of impacts do you think that this policy could have on the communities you represent? Or do you have any other thoughts about this major service change policy? Um, I can start. Um, I would say if one of the biggest impacts that we know is even when there is a change of destination, um, we hear from some of our community members that um, if you are new to the area, there is, it's hard to um, learn the bus system in regards to routes. Um, because they have listed that there are some bus stops within the Route 1 corridor where it doesn't tell you what bus is coming. So you have to go and look online to figure out what bus is that stop. So I think even with any changes, if they are um, increasing or um, decreasing the length, it's going to change. Um, it's going to be hard for people to adapt because it's already hard for them to understand um, and know what it, bus route is um, that bus going to. So I also just even thinking about, um, we've had community members letting us know that um, when they get uh, notifications about any changes that are happening for delays, some of them have the app um, that tells them um, if it's, we know that some of our community members don't speak English, so it's even hard for them to understand what they're reading. So they kind of have to become a little tech savvy or ask their children to let them know of what's happening. Thank you. That's very helpful to hear. Um, and also part of the Title VI program is about making, documenting what FCDOT will be doing to make sure that they are providing the proper language access to riders. So that's really helpful um, feedback to hear as we're working on that. Can, can I ask a real quick clarifying question? So it sounds like some of the bus stops you're saying on Route 1 in particular, our, our, our Richmond Highway, are not uh, marked clearly in terms of which routes stop there. Is that? Yes, that's correct. Do you have an idea of like the general area? It. Um, or is it all along the entire length of, of Richmond Highway? It's. It's some it's I know there's four in particular. I don't know exactly where they are. Um, and I just know because we had a community member who actually took the wrong bus trying to get to us. And she, it was oh, no. because because she, she was on the bus stop thinking that was the bus was going to pass through there. And she let me know there that um, she took a picture and she said, it doesn't tell you what buses are coming here. I thought all oh, buses pass by here. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I. Yeah. I don't use the bus system in Fairfax County, so I was letting her know. I was like, I let's figure it out. Um, but I will say there are, there's there's three to four that don't have um, that does, there's it doesn't tell you what buses ex are passing by. Okay, well thanks. Uh, it's really good feedback in general, so appreciate that. I don't know what our policy is supposed to be on each of the individual stops, but I would presume yeah, I it, think it that should should be marked. This is a uh, yeah. Thanks for the feedback. This typically uh, we do not put the round number at each bus stop unless it's a it's at a major hub or metro stations, and uh, we typically refer to people using the bus tracker, our uh, um, like a real time uh, bus uh, information. So that way, when people tap the use their phone or uh, go to online, uh, tap the bus stop ID, they will know like uh, what bus routes this stop will be served. And in the case that if the bus stop is there and uh, certain routes do not make a stop, say if a bus route is express route, it doesn't make at each local stop, we should have um, a guide, uh, 
they are saying this stop is not going to be served by certain round number. So that information is typically provided. But if you have more information and you can share with us the bus stop location and we can take a closer look at. OK, thank you. Um, is this also, I guess, another question to follow up is. Um, so there are some bus stops and there's one in particular where it, there is no sidewalk, it's just a bus stop. Um, and that was another one where I know a lot of our community members see that they wish they had at least if it, they're like, if it, there's not a little house, especially because when it rains or something to sit on, it is very hard for us to wait for the bus, that particular bus stop, just because there is no sidewalk and they have to just walk um, around it and just to make sure to get there. So, um, and this is again on Richmond Highway, Ivana? Yes. Yeah, so the Richmond Highway corridor is, is going to be undergoing a, a, a massive facelift when the uh, Richmond Highway BRT system, the bus rapid transit system, gets installed and they'll have sidewalks on both sides and shared use paths and so forth in various locations. So um, I don't know specifically where you're talking about, but I, I, I can tell you that I, the infrastructure along uh, Richmond Highway in terms of getting to the bus stop should improve pretty dramatically in the near, you know, next five to 10 years. Okay. Not helpful in the short term, but long term, it, there's going to be a lot of investment there. So I have a more general question. So with 25% being the threshold, um, what is the recourse if you find that you and people in your identity class are affected by a change, but it doesn't actually break the threshold? Is there any way for your concerns to be heard um, and or processed? Sure. Um, so yeah, if a service change would not meet the major service change threshold, there's still the possibility that the Title VI analysis could move forward, um, but that's up to FCDOT's discretion. Um, Brent or, or somebody else, what would be the best ways, what are the best ways that the community can learn about upcoming service changes and provide feedback about those service changes? Yeah, I'd defer to Robin well, or somebody or Kyle. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh. Okay. I think oh, that's okay. Um, it, with every service change, we do try to um, do our best to notify the public through our standard procedures, which would be like news releases, social media, Fairfax alerts. Um, but we also work with our uh, neighborhood and community services and send out to um, nonprofits as much as we can. And with our new um, engaged Fairfax framework and policy, we're trying to um, even do a better job through, uh, you know, working with nonprofit partners to make sure they know um, about what's coming up, meet public meetings so they uh, we can get as many people as possible to participate and um, have real engagement um, from people who ride connector and who, uh, you know, need to make to give input that it would make our um, service changes work for them. So uh, we're branching out even further in terms of identifying languages spoken in different areas of the county um, and vulnerable neighborhoods. So um, we're, we're trying to just continue to improve in our outreach efforts. And we welcome, you know, working with folks from nonprofits is like, you know, putting a pebble in a pond and hoping that the message gets out. Um, that you could help share the information um, when you receive it. And we welcome any ideas as well. So um, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. So so the, the due process is more of a beforehand, not necessarily once the policy is implemented and you realize that you're impacted um, afterwards 
Well, I think that the nature of a Connector and our service change and outreach in terms of trying to make the system work for people and make it better is that it's kind of a living, you know, evolving um, service because mm-hmm. we go out for service changes. Um, and I do know that our planning team also checks to see if things are working, um, you know, working and, and making sure that things are timely and, um, you know, routes are on time. I mean, there, there's the after effect of making sure, you know, that um, what has been planned is working. But but by and large, our most of our service change um, outreach is done before the service change occurs. But but we're looking, you know, things are evolving over time all the time. So we always welcome comments from folks um, who ride Fairfax Connector to make it work for them. But the official formal service changes, we do a lot of outreach before. Um, we do go to public engagement events um, throughout the county. We do, um, you know, festivals, uh, events, and then sometimes um uh, <laughs> NCS meetings. So we, we just always like to hear what's working and what, what how we could improve even at those events. So yeah, let me um, jump in here. So when we conduct the service change, we start out with um, um, analyzing data and talking to customers. We start out with things like on onboard surveys. Um, we have uh, we gather and analyze data, and by data, I don't just mean empirical data, but actual anecdotal data. You know, when people submit comments to us, you know, people say, hey, I, you know, we need service here, or, you know, there's more, there's a demand for more service over there. You know, we gather all of those comments. We analyze our own internal data. Um, it's a combination of things that we have onboard surveys. We this, There's a combination of things that we use that go into developing service proposals. And these proposals, once they're fleshed out, once they're developed, um, we present them in the form of public meetings. Um, and those public meetings, you know, we you know, we give people an opportunity to uh, provide their feedback on the service changes. And only after that process do we go before the County Board of Supervisors and get uh and seek approval but until the board of supervisors approves it it's not set in stone so you know there's multiple layers of you know gathering feedback and hearing from the community and also just our own data and what we're seeing on the ground and then even then you know having people provide feedback at public meetings um before going to seek official approval from uh elected officials so um, th- that that's essentially the process and how we make sure that we retain community engagement and community involvement in every step of the process. And I would imagine there's an evaluation um, process afterwards. Yes. Yeah. I, right. When we have a public meeting, you know, we look at all of the feedback that we have uh, before and after the public meetings in order to determine if there's issues that we need to uh, take another look at, uh, retweak, retool, however you want to say it, and, you know, we we act accordingly. So very quickly, this is Brad. I, I just want to be cognizant of the fact that we don't have a whole lot of time left allocated for this and want to make sure that we get through the rest of the, of the presentation. So. Yeah, we should move on to the DIDB. Uh, portion now so we can make sure we cover that policy as well. Okay, well, thank you for the discussion though on on those things. It sounds like we're learning some things, which is good. Um, I'm going to talk for the next little bit about the disparate impact and disproportionate burden or DIDB policies. This is the next step after a major service change evaluation if we determine or if Fairfax DOT determines that uh, that a service change is in fact major. So we've been talking about this for a few minutes. Every service change is evaluated to see if it's significant, if it's major. And if a service change is determined to be a major service change, 
we do a service or fair equity analysis to figure out whether that sort of major service change has equity impacts or not. We have two kinds. One is a disparate impact, which is the effect that it may have on minority riders, and a disproportionate burden, which is the impact that it may have on low income riders. And at Fairfax DOT sets policies, DIDB policies, which help determine if a major service change will result in inequities or inequitable impacts. So we have this kind of waterfall from major service change, uh, equity analysis, and DIDB determination. So what are we talking about here? Uh, we have we've talked we've identified these two types. These are the technical definitions of disparate impact and disproportionate burden. A disparate impact is a policy that appears neutral, but whose impacts affect racial, ethnic, or national origin groups in a substantially non-neutral way. Likewise, disproportionate burden is a policy that appears neutral, but impacts low-income populations far more than non-low-income populations. DIs and DBs can occur in two kinds of situations. They can occur when service is removed or reduced, which I think is a more obvious kind of example where there are fewer bus stops uh, proposed or shorter operating hours, or as you all have mentioned, when frequency might be reduced uh, if the bus is no longer coming every 15 minutes, is coming every 30 or go from 30 to an hour or something like that. Um, Service changes that remove service disproportionately used by minority or low income communities are said to have a uh, disproportionate impact, or sorry, disparate impact or a disproportionate burden. Likewise, DIs and DBs can occur when service is added or expanded, which might be a little bit counterintuitive, but if service is added in an area where the population is mostly a majority racial, ethnic, or national origin group, or not low income, uh, and they end up having a lot more access than minority or lower income groups, then the expansion is still creating a significant difference that disadvantages the minority and low income groups. So uh, both situations can have a DR or DB finding. So um, as we said, whereas DIDBs occur when services, or, I'm sorry, um, we can have both DIDBs when service is removed, which is a situation where minority or low-income populations receive an unfair cut to service, and DIDBs can happen when service is expanded, where non-minority or non-low-income populations receive an unfair benefit. The point is to make sure that service is fair across all these different groups and in all these different areas. I'll stop for a second. Does anybody have any questions about DIs and DBs and the addition and reduction directions that we can find these things in? We're going to go through a calculation example in a second, but conceptually, it's making sense for folks. Um, oh, I see Brent, you're handling Catherine's question there in the chat. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, does that make sense? Catherine, before we move on. Yeah, the, the rules, the, the federal that. policy that governs uh, people with disabilities is the American Disabilities Act, uh, which is a separate, you know, set of policies and concerns that we're not addressing here today. Right. Right, Title VI doesn't, doesn't necessarily cover that, but there is a separate policy for that too. Okay, so I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, so how do we actually determine if a DI or a DB has occurred? The question we're asking is how much will a service change impact minority or low income populations in the route area, which we talked about before, relative to the minority or low income populations in the broader service area? Uh, the DRDB policy sets percentage thresholds that determine what counts as a disparate impact or a disproportionate burden. The calculation is a little different 
depending on whether you're adding or removing service to make sure that it's fair. And federal guidance in that circular document that the Federal Transit Administration uh, publishes for Title VI has this um, guidance that transit provider thresholds that the agencies set should be tripped sometimes. You should trigger a DRDB periodically. You shouldn't always be finding disparate impact or disproportionate burden, but periodically you should. So you should be on the line and under, you know, really have a policy that's tailored to the area. What happens when a DRDB is found? So we're doing our service equity analysis to determine that a proposed major service change will or will not create a DRDB. But even if we do find a DRDB, it does not mean that the transit provider cannot make this change. The transit agency can still make the change if they meet one of two conditions. Either show substantial legitimate justification for the change, say there's a long-term construction project that's going to improve access in the long run, but we have to move it today or something like this, or prove that there are no alternatives that would reduce the harm to the affected community. The transit service provider, in this case, Fairfax DOT, Fairfax Connector, must provide documentation for those conditions and meeting those conditions as part of its service equity analysis that it conducts. So we've talked about this a little conceptually. On the next few slides, we're gonna go through some examples that utilize this policy and the calculations uh, to show you how this would work in practice. Um, the FCDOT disparate impact policy, we'll discuss that one first, is this one. The language on this slide, which I'll read in a second, is proposed, um, FCDOT is proposing to update the language for clarity, but this policy is the same as in the last program. A disparate impact or DI occurs under the following circumstances. For a proposed service increase or fair reduction, you calculate the service area minority population percent minus the root area minority population percent. If the result is greater than or equal to 10%, then a DI has occurred. Likewise, for a proposed service reduction or fair increase, you calculate root area minority percent population percent minus the service area minority population percent. If the result is greater than or equal to 10%, then a DI has also occurred. So as I said, this 10% threshold that's articulated here is the same as the last program, but the text has been revised for clarity. It was, it, this is easier to understand. So we'll go through some examples very fast. Um, so our, in our first example, we're gonna remove or reduce service. Um, our service area, as we discussed at the top, is 50% minority. And in our scenario here, the transit agency wants to eliminate a route. So applying our policy, as long as, as long as fewer than 50% plus the 10% threshold, so 60% of the people living in the area of the affected route are minority, the service change passes the service equity te test. Um, pay that 10% number again, that comes from the policy. So we're trying to make sure that the route area has not just more, but significantly more people from minority backgrounds living there. And, and that helps us determine if the change is equitable. So let's consider a route. Uh, we have our service area statistics there again on the slide, but in this box we have a theoretical route that has a route area population where 55% of them of the people living there uh, are minority. Our test is to determine whether this route area has significantly greater minority population than the rest of the service area. Since 55 is less than our calculated threshold of 60, this change is considered equitable. Another way to think about it is 55, which is our root area, minus 50, which is our service area population proportion, is 5%, which is less than 10. Now let's consider another route. This route, instead of 55, has 65% minority uh, population living in the route area. It's a larger presence. So we do the same test. Since 
65 is greater than our calculated threshold of 60. This change is considered not equitable. Another, and as I said, another way to think about it is 65 minus 50. The root area minus the service area is 15, which is greater than our 10% threshold. In this case, the service change, we've triggered a DI. We've triggered a uh, disproportionate impact, a disparate impact, excuse me. Okay, we'll talk about service expansion now. Um, the service area is still 50%. Minority and the transit agency wants to add a route instead of take one away. So we actually flip the direction of the calculation. Rather than add the 10% threshold, we subtract it because we don't want to disproportionately benefit people who are not from the populations that we care about to make sure that the change is equitable. So let's consider these routes. First route area, the minority population is. 45% in the non-minority population is 55%, but our threshold is 40, remember, because we're adding service. So our test finds that since 45 is greater than our um, population threshold of 40, this change is still considered equitable. But if we consider a route where the minority population is 25% and the non-minority population is 75%, uh, the 25 is much less than 40%. And so this change is considered not equitable. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over our examples. I'm going to read the DB policy, but I'm going to skip over the examples because the calculations are the same. We're just using different population, uh, different population than minority. We're talking about low income people. Um, we'll cut ahead to the larger discussion, but I will read this disproportionate burden policy to you here. It's uh, as before. FCDOT is proposing to update the language for this policy, but the threshold is remaining the same as under the prior program. A disproportionate burden, DB, occurs under the following circumstances. For a proposed service increase or fare reduction, calculate the service area low income population percent minus the root area low income population percent. If the result is greater than or equal to 10%, then a DB has occurred. Likewise, for a proposed service reduction or fair increase, calculate the root area low income population percent minus the service area low income population percent. If that result is greater than or equal to 10%, then ADB has occurred. So I will skip ahead to a little bit um, because the calculations are the same. What happens when a DI or a DB is found? Um, when a service area, I'm sorry, service equity analysis determines that a major service change. Oh, we actually talked about this already. So um, as we talked about, you may find a, a duplicate slide. If you find a DI or DB, uh, ordinarily you would not be able to make the service change, but there is some flexibility for the agency uh, in certain situations, uh, and the agency has to document uh, that it meets these two conditions if it wants to proceed. So we're at time. I think we're at time, we're very near it. Um, but uh, if, if it, folks can stay for another couple of minutes and, and give us your thoughts, uh, we would really like to hear from you uh, based on what we've just discussed, what kind of impacts these DIDB policies might have on the communities you represent, some examples you might have. Um, and if you think these DIDB policies are appropriate, if that 10% threshold, I know population proportions are a little abstract, but um, if you think these are appropriate or if they should be changed. Or if we can clarify anything we just talked about. You know, I went through it very quickly. 
um, my question is, um, if for these changes, are you guys going to have um, focus groups to talk to the community about their um, perspective of the changes? So, the outreach that we're doing. Oh, sorry, Brent. You want to go ahead? Oh, go ahead. Go for it. So the outreach that we're doing for these policies includes the discussions that we're having with stakeholders um, today and tomorrow and the public survey that we have released. And actually, let me send that link now because I didn't send it earlier. Um, the release of these policies, maybe Robin, could you talk a little bit about the kind of promotion of this opportunity to engage? Sure. Um, we'll be we'll, actually we're going to be sending out a news release today. The survey opens today. It's open through May 5th um, and we'll also be sending it to um, our nonprofit groups um, and um, working with our uh, community partners as well as our uh, neighborhood and community services and our other county agencies to share as well. So that that's going to be going out today um, to invite people to participate in the survey. And um, it goes through May 5th. And you can participate in the survey or um, you can, uh, the information that will be sent out, you know, people can call, they can write um, and snail mail to an address um, or participate in the survey. So. Yes, but please dis disseminate it far and wide to, to, yeah. to the people that you work with, your constituents would be, would be really helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah. Also, Is just some highlights. Say again. I was going to say um, the link that you guys provided when I got to it, the Spanish version takes me to an Ordu um, survey. There's no Spanish translation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, lo that link looks like it needs to be updated. I'll go check and see what's happening. The rest of them look correct. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. We'll fix it. Is there a correlation between the policies that are being proposed and actual proposals? Because making the connection between the policy and actual changes, it, it's a little abstract. Um, and so, you know, the policy sounds good. Um, but since we know that we're talking about a subset of the total population, I'm just wondering if you know, the thresholds that you're proposing, um, if it's sensitive enough, sensitive enough to pick up on, you know, um, impact. Um, and then in terms of getting the information out to ridership or potential ridership and having them give feedback, um, I think without an actual connection to the policy and an actual proposal, that's going to be a little challenging to do. Those are, those are really, really, really good points. Um, it, it is difficult to sort of understand this out of context, and it, it's a challenge that we definitely have in communicating what's being proposed to you without sort of giving you some sort of real life example to, to look at. Um, I can say we have done these analyses in the past um, on previous, you know, other routes and other, you know, service changes that we've done. Um, and we could, you know, possibly share those as examples, but they're pretty, you know, I, I don't know how meaningful they'll be for you to read through, but uh, sure. that's one thing we could do. But there's and no way of really of knowing moving forward if, like, if there are current policy or proposals that are on the table. Yeah, we yeah, don't have process. it. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Sorry. I was going to say this process happens outside of any actual proposed service changes. Just the policy updates are kind of right. happening on their own. And then any types of service changes that would happen after this update to the Title VI program would then be subject to these new policies. So yeah. um, as part of the program update, we do document um, how, like over the course of the past three years, when these analyses have occurred. So in part of our work up until this stage, what we've been trying to do is, eval is to evaluate um, how well these policies worked over the last couple of years. Mm. Did they result 
in some service changes, meeting the major service change threshold and then requiring further analysis? And the answer is yes, there were a number of service changes that met the major service change threshold and then required further analysis. And then we also analyzed once they got to that service equity analysis phase, um, how much of these changes did trigger a DI or a DB finding? And some of them did. I think it was very few this time. And I was just trying to check and I couldn't find it. I think maybe there was one or two. Um, and when we set the policy, what we're trying to do is to set it to the point where um, I think, and Russell had talked on this a little bit, is that we're trying to make sure it's set at a place where sometimes a DIDB will be found and sometimes it won't. So we don't want every single thing to trigger DIDB. That would probably be overkill and not an accurate representation of what's actually happening. But we also don't want it to be set too little that we're not getting any kind of meaningful results. So when we looked at what was happening over the last couple of years with these same thresholds, um, we were finding that it seemed to be reasonable place to set it. And those all those updates will be included in the public facing Title VI program when we release that later this year. I think sharing historic effectiveness um, or historical effectiveness would be would be good. Absolutely. I will also highlight that um, in the survey, one thing I know with working with community members is that just to be careful when using specific academic words. I know one in particular when we highlight disproportionate, a lot of community members don't know what that means. Um, so just even using that, breaking it down to them or something that highlights that I'm doing the survey right now, just trying to see what questions are being asked um, and what questions I know may rise from community members. And that's going to be one of them. I've been previously in a meeting with them yeah. two weeks ago. Um, they used the word disproportionate and a lot of people did not know what that meant and we had to explain to them. So just even um, there's going to be some words that are too academic, so just is there's a way to just breaking it down or maybe using a different word that can help them understand um, what is being asked. That, that's a really, really good point too. Um, unfortunately, we're also sort of constrained by this is a federal policy and these are federal definitions, um, but maybe we can find ways to, you know, use different vernacular, different different language to you know, communicate the same concepts. I will also add, um, so uh, part of my work, uh, I work with community members and they have WhatsApp groups in the uh, communities um, that we serve. And I've asked a question right now to them to see if there's any opinions they have on possible changes. And someone um, highlighted right now that when you guys take account in calculating if shortening or um, increasing time, are you guys also going to count uh, peak times during traffic hours? And this is just because in the Route 1 corridor, there are certain times, especially if you come at 5 p.m., traffic is almost at a standstill. So will that be included in um, just the policy change when we think about time? Right the way that now... Oh, go ahead, Lori. Sorry. Oh, I was going to um, say right now the policy doesn't distinguish between what particular sub part, you know, whatever a smaller part of the day the service change may occur in. So in the in the examples from earlier, we just talked about the total span, and and the policy only talks about the total span, the total period of time during the day, uh, rather than how much of it operates in peak hours as opposed to non-peak hours of the day. Yeah, That's every, what the hour of the, every hour of the day is treated the same. That's what I was going to say, Russell, thanks. OK. So, um, Thank you all for your feedback. This is really helpful. And by the way, you know, don't uh, stop giving us feedback. You know, now you, you're welcome to, as Robin indicated earlier, you know, reach out to us at any point in time to talk to us about either this uh, policy issue that we're discussing today, you know, the major service change and DIDB policies, or just anything in general, you know, like your, Ivana, with your, your bus stop uh, marking 
issue and you know any, any of these kinds of um, issues that are arise with the communities that you work with and you know any feedback that you might have I, I think we're all very very receptive to that and trying to make uh, Fairfax connector as as uh, you know useful for everybody in the county as, as possible so really really appreciate that do we have any other closing comments or thoughts from from Lori from anybody that we have everything that we need yeah, thank you all very much. Really helpful feedback. Yes, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Have a Thanks good rest of your day. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.